Good morning, guys. Hi, Hal. Hey, George. Hey, Emily. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, and, uh, I need to uh, ask you a couple of questions in regards to the ad I posted. I can't Yeah, so um, can I give you a call this afternoon at around 4? Yeah. Four right. this Sometime between 4 and 5, I, I, I can chat in with you about that. I, I wanted to kind of give you some thoughts around that. Okay. Cool. I just can't pay for it. I don't know why. What's that? I just can't pay for it. In terms of it, in, in command, in terms of your setup? Yeah. It says uh, it still be, it needs to be uh, okayed or published, but I can't pay for the ad. All right. I'm not sure. I would, I would direct that question first to Chris Gareffa. Uh, which market center are you in? Uh, Woodcliff Lake. Um, who, I would go back to Stephanie in your office first to just make sure that the setup is right because there needs to be okay. a payment source attached to your command account. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we'll chat this afternoon because I still want to talk to you a little bit about video versus other stuff. But uh, when we're done here, why don't you jump in with Stephanie and see if she can help you walk through that. All right. Thank you. Okay. Right. Hey, Daniel. Hey, Emily. How are you guys? Hey, good morning. Hi, Hal. Good. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. Give a couple of minutes for folks to jump on here. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. This actually is one of my favorite. I have a lot of favorite parts of this series, but I love this series, this part with agent to agent referrals. And even when we do, we dabble into profit share. So, um, I'll give people a minute to get in and I'll give you a little context as to why I think this is such a uh, such an overlooked opportunity for agents and one that can be really, really profitable if you do it well. So anyway, we'll give people another minute. Didn't you mention how you have a, a referral business? Uh, I have two businesses. I own two brokerages. Um, one is a or just a referral agency, which is a company that holds agents referral licenses when they're not fully practicing real estate any longer and they want to go into a referral status. Um, I do own a brokerage that holds those licenses. Uh, but I have another company that actually does um, lead generation and then places referrals for agents based on uh, some metrics that we use in terms of determining where to place those. And, uh, and so I think, you know, I think, uh, and I'll talk about it in a minute here, but I think that there's a huge opportunity here. I don't know if necessarily people need to build a whole business model around generating leads, percolating them and placing them. Um, but I do think that really thinking about agent to agent referrals as part of your ongoing income stream is, um, is smart for a lot of folks, right? So here's the thing. It's uh, 11.05. I don't want to, we have a lot to get through today. So I want to honor your time for those of you that are on time. Give me a minute to um, call up the PowerPoint. And I hope you can see that. Uh, slideshow from the beginning. Okay, so this is the, the module here on um, agent to agent referrals. And we do, it's not part of the traditional KW uh, curriculum here in Legion to talk about profit share. But when we're thinking about agent relationships, I like to tie profit share in a little bit and we do a kind of a high level review of the opportunity that profit share is inside this company. So let me get started. Somebody give me a thumbs up to show me that you can see this PowerPoint. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Yes. Cool. Yes, thank you. All right. So here's where we are. Um, we've kind of gone through all these different lead generation levers and where we're going to go next. And just to kind of give you a little sense of where we're going, because we are a little bit off kilter now when we, we did have Friday last off for Juneteenth. Now it pushed everything back a little bit. <clears throat> so, so we're doing this module today. On Friday, we're going to do the lead conversion and pipeline management module here. And then on Monday of next week, which we hadn't planned for, but we are adding a day now. On Monday of next week, we're going to do this last module here on living your goals. And, and so here's the thing. This is why I think this is such a great opportunity. I think when you think about all the dollar productive activities that you can do in real estate, agent to agent referrals tends to be the highest payoff for the amount of time invested. But we're going to talk about why and, and how that looks in a little bit. But of all the different things that you do, especially when you place an outbound referral, 
you know, when you build relationships, we're going to talk about how to do that the right way today. When you send a referral out to someone that you've cultivated and, um, and they do all the work and you just kind of hang back and wait for the closing check to arrive, when you think about the amount of energy that you put into it, <clears throat> there is some because it's, it really is about cultivating this relationship just like anyone else in your database. But the payoff can be pretty big. And the other side of that coin is when you receive referrals, the beauty of that is not only do you get to get the lion's share of that commission because you will pay a referral fee, and we'll talk about what that looks like in a minute, but what you get is business that you didn't have to cultivate, that you didn't have to invest any time or energy really other than nurturing your agent partnership relationship to make that happen. So huge opportunity here to really untap resource. If you look here, at, uh, this is from the 2000 and I believe 19 survey of buyers and sellers from the National Association of Realtors. And if you look at where did people find the agent that they hired, this is uh, on the seller side, right? Of all sellers, number one is a referral from a, a friend or a relative, right? Number two, as I used the agent previously, if you look at this, two numbers combined, we're at two thirds, 66% of the sellers either used someone that they already had used before or someone that was referred by someone that they like and trust. You can see why focusing on your database as your primary source of business has to be the thing that makes the most sense. Because the people that are gonna hire you are already in your world somewhere. You just have to keep nurturing them. Then you look and start to see it falls off the cliff after that. 5% of the sellers found their agent. Uh, the agent contacted them through prospecting efforts, 4% from a website, 3% visited the agent at an open house. Another 3% uh, was referred by another agent or broker. <clears throat> so if you really look at this, the amount of business that we get from agent to agent referrals is about the same as what we get from open houses. Somebody just unmute and just tell me what's going on in your head as I say that. <laughs> any thoughts about that? Does that send any light bulbs off in your head? It sounds like really low hanging fruit that we need to cultivate. It's fruit that can be cultivated and, and um, absolutely, right? Of all the different things that we do to prospect, <clears throat> that are, that are um, meeting with all kinds of different resistance and all these different things. If we can nurture these relationships, it's really low hanging fruit. Let's look at buyer side. 41% of the buyers hired an agent through a referral friend neighborhood, uh, excuse me, friend neighbor or someone that they trusted. Another 12% had used their buyer's agent previously. Again, we're at, you combine those two, you're at 53% of the buyer's already had a relationship with the agent that they used. We're back into database cultivation. And then we look on the buyer side. What we found is 7% um, use the agent after inquiring specifically about property online. This is part of the reason why we talk so much about Facebook advertising and things like that. Because if you can get some good clickbait out there online, and get people to click on that so that you capture their information. George, you and I were talking about this yesterday. If you can get that information, 7%, it's the second, if you, if you combine these two together as kind of sphere of influence, after that, it is the number one source of finding a buyer to work with is through online inquiries. It, that's really different than it was five years ago, but this industry is changing so rapidly in terms of how the internet is playing it. 6% referred by another real estate agent and broker. And then if you really go down, it's only 5% for open houses, right? And so the point of the matter is, agent to agent referrals when done right and not done haphazardly is one of the strongest sources of business if you cultivate it. And I think that so many times what we do as agents and the mistake that I made when I was more actively selling is I always kind of saw agent to agent referrals as just something that was a bonus. If it came along, if it kind of fell into my lap, yay for me, I had a good day but I never really thought about what would it look like for me to go out there and purposefully develop this income stream. And we're gonna get into profit share. I think the same thing is true about profit share as well. So Doris Carlin, who is one of the operating partners out in uh, the Midwest somewhere, what she talks about referrals and she calls it A to A. And so what she, it's two different asks. Always remember to ask for two different things. Don't leave money on the table when a seller is looking to buy the next home. Right? Nobody sells their house 
with the plan of becoming homeless, where are you going next? Can I help you with that, right? In many ways, we're trying to see if I can participate in that. If you sell your house and you're staying in the area and I can physically help you buy that house, that's great. If you're leaving the area, can I refer you out to somebody who's competent in that marketplace? And um, just something always to be thinking about is what's the next step for your client? When you have a buyer, right? Where are they coming from? Can you get some help for them on the sell side if that's appropriate, right? Always just be thinking about the other side of the transaction and how you can put yourself in. We're not gonna really do this exercise right now in the interest of time, but one of the things I would encourage you to do later on today or this week is to go into your database and ask yourself the question, how many real estate agents do you have existing in your database? You know, and I, I will tell you that there are some folks who, who don't believe that it's a good idea to have other agents in your database. Um, they see the other agents as competition and there's really no rela reason to, to have a relationship with them. I, I think sometimes the same is held in, in social media. Um, you know, I'm competing with these agents for business, so why should I be social media partners or friends with them? I, I think while that can sometimes be used where... Um, I have heard stories where, where people will uh, maybe say things or, or do things that they'll, they'll post things on your Facebook page or something like that, advertising their own business, which is just really cheesy to do. That's so unusual. I think that nurturing these relationships is really important. And the thing I'd ask you to do is go back and look in your database, not so much your social accounts right now, but in your database, how many agents do you have and what is happening, if anything, to continually nurture those relationships, right? How many do you touch on a regular basis? What percentage of your business is coming from agent to agent referrals, right? And if you're newer to the business and you don't have a track record with that, remember everything that we do when we get leads in, we've got to source where did this lead come from, right? And there's a place where you can put that right in command when you get that lead. And let me reframe that language in the language of command. We're calling it a lead. <clears throat> when we have information in one-way communication, we're calling it a contact. When we're actually engaged in two-way communication, it's our contacts that become our clients. But when we put them in the database, absolutely critical to, to, to trace where did this come from. So as deals begin to close, you can start to see the pattern of what's working. Right? So what percentage of your business is coming? We're not going to do that exercise, but I'd encourage you to look in. Giving and receiving referrals from another agent. Here's the beauty of them. They're almost always hot leads. It's, it's when you think about it as a receiving agent of a lead, you're not going to be really receptive to an ice cold lead because there's a referral fee attached to it. So for somebody to say to you, Hey, you know what? Um, I'm looking for a referral agent that handles business in the Fort Lee area. You respond to them and say, hey, I can handle Fort Lee. <clears throat> and they say, here's the name. Here's the contact information. 25% referral is what I'm looking for. Um, actually, you negotiate the referral fee first. We'll talk about that later. <clears throat> but when you start to find out what do you know about this client and they say, well, really, I don't know anything about them. They just responded to an email ad. That really isn't worth the referral fee. <laughs> that is so stone cold that you haven't earned the right to my commission at that point for me to cultivate that, develop that lead, and then close it myself. I'm doing all the work. What happens, what I'm willing to pay for, is if you have somebody who's ready, willing, and able to go, it's just not in your wheelhouse, it's not in your area, and you're looking for somebody to take that over, that I would pay for, right? So the good news is that when you're receiving leads, they're almost always hotter leads, right? They take less time to prospect, there's high pay, and you didn't have to do all the legwork. Pros and cons. Here's the pros of receiving referrals. You get a ready, willing, and able customer, right? You earn 70 to 85% of the commission because in the typical world that we work in here, the typical referral fee is usually about 25% of the overall commission. So let's do the math. On a $400,000 sale with 2.5% on one transaction buy side, that's a $10,000 gross commission. And the reason why I picked 400 because the math are, evens out to 10,000, it's super easy that way. But if there's $10,000 of total commission for the, if you're receiving the referral, you're paying that agent something for giving it to you. And typically the fee is 25% of that or $2,500.
that's kind of the, the model mindset of the other business that I, that I run outside of, of what I do here is I generate the leads, I cultivate the leads, and I warm them up so that when I hand them off, they're hot because no good agent wants to take a nice cold lead. And for doing that, I, I earn 25% of the overall commission, right? The customer is well served by you. That's a benefit. The customer becomes your client going forward, your repeat client going forward. We know that most people use an agent that they already have a relationship with. And when the referral source sends them to you, you get to be that source of ongoing business, ongoing referral. So there's a huge upside, not just this transaction that I pay something to get them into my database, but the lifetime of value of that lead over time is well beyond this individual transaction. It's all the repeat and referral business as well, right? The downside is you're paying something for it. But if you're going to give me, if you're going to give me good hot leads, I'm willing to pay for it. And, and I'll be honest with you. I, I'm of the mindset that I'm generous here. If you're giving me good, solid leads that close, that convert, I'm going to pay a premium for those. Um, the market average, maybe 25%. I'll give you 30. Because if you've got good quality leads that can be closed and turned into, into ready transactions that I didn't have to cultivate over time, the value of that time savings to me makes it worth me paying a premium and incentivizing you to use me again, because you're going to make more if you use me than if you use another agent in the market. So there's, there's some real benefits, more benefits than negatives. And I don't even see this as a negative. I see this as an investment in your business. Now, the responsibility when you get a lead, a referral, right? <clears throat> if you accept a referral, first thing you have to do is be timely. You know, there's nothing worse then being given a referral and then not responding quickly enough and having that client go back to the referral source and say, gee, you know, I haven't heard from Hal yet. Um, when do you think I'm going to hear from him? Then that makes that referral source look foolish and look like they hadn't really thought this through and picked somebody, value, somebody good. And so you're not going to get more referrals. You respond quickly. Speed to lead is no different here than it is anywhere else. Um, you want to provide solutions along the way. You want to have great local market experience, be committed and capable of working with that referred customer, really, really know where your strengths are. <clears throat> and just like anything else, early on when we were trying to determine who is your ideal client, what we're trying to do is to build re referral partners with people who can refer our ideal clients. If someone is referred who's outside of our experience or our skill set, you know, do the right thing. Don't take it because it may not be the right fit for that client. You know, if you get a call from somebody who's got somebody who's way outside of your market area, yes, you're licensed in New Jersey and you can serve anywhere if you belong to the MLS, but are you really the best capable agent to serve in a market that you know nothing about? Is it a property type that you don't really know enough about? For example, multifamily homes of four units, five units, six units, medical office space, or any kind of commercial space, if it's not something that you really know well, distressed properties. Guys, just sidebar here. With what's going on in our economy right now, with one in five people being unemployed, we know a couple things are happening. There's going to be a rash of evictions. Those evictions are likely to be more tenants than homeowners because there are protections in place right now for folks who are behind on their mortgages. However, those protections aren't going to last forever. And at some point, I do believe you're going to start to see an uptick in certain areas with, with um, distressed properties again. Now would be the time to learn how to work short sales properly and to get familiar with bank owned properties because I do see some of this at the top of the funnel that's going to work its way through. But if you are referred to short sale and you've never done a short sale, you're not going to do well by that client to take business on that you don't do well. So do the right thing. Know where your strengths are. Be willing to refer it to someone else the same way every other professional behaves. Every doctor who has someone show up in their waiting room who needs a procedure that they don't specialize in is going to refer them to the right doctor. That's what professionals do because they trust that the pipeline will provide them enough of the right clients. And that's what we have to believe as well. I just see something popped up in the chat. I don't know how long this has been sitting here. So let me open this up. There's a question that says, uh, Susie, I see that it's a private question. I'll get back to you on that one. Um, okay. So know the city, know the resource, know everything about the community so that you can be seen, not just for the clients who are reaching out to you, but to the person who's going to send them. 
as the referral source of choice, right? The responsibilities continue. You've got to know the builders. You've got to know the new home inventory. You've got to know all the subdivisions. This is all about being the hyper-local market expert. Be patient, be flexible, stay current in your market, be educated, right? You just have to be the best. That's the name of the game. You have to be the hyper-local expert. Um, giving referrals, setting referrals, here's the pros and cons. The pros are you're going to earn 15 to 30% of the referral for, for relatively minimal work. And I, I would contend as somebody who's running a business on this business model, it's not, it's not effortless when you think about the work that it takes to cultivate someone who is ready, willing, and able to buy. But what I'll tell you is when you're looking to find somebody who is going to buy outside of your area, where they're leaving your market area, generally speaking, um, once you hand them off, all the work of getting the house, finding the house, getting under contract, negotiating the deal, getting it to the closing table, that's not your work any longer. So there are some cost advantages. The price range here or the referral fee range here really does vary. When you're, when you're sending referrals out into market areas where the average price point is lower and the total commission dollars is lower, what you may find is that 25% of the commission may seem too steep in certain markets. For us up here in the tri-state area with property values that are way above the norm for the, for the country, 25% still leaves you a reasonably strong commission. If you're sending a referral out into you know, West Texas where the average price may be $185,000 and that total commission is gonna be something on the order of you know, just a few thousand dollars, the agent may be less willing to give you 25 or 30%. Don't be surprised in some markets if 15% is more customary there. But the point is, there's still income coming in that after that moment, it's the other agent who does all the work, right? You get to choose the agent. And we're going to talk about how do you choose the agent? How do you qualify the agent? What's important to you? And making sure that the person that you refer um, is an extension of your value proposition. And so if you, if you have the trust and confidence of your client and you refer them out to somebody who's a complete bonehead, shame on you, right? We can't just, it makes me crazy a little bit sometimes to look in some of these social media groups, these Facebook groups, where people say in this group of 10,000 agents or more, looking for a rock star agent in Cleveland, Ohio, because I've got a referral to give this weekend. And you have 95 people coming up saying, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. And I guess, yeah, you do, you can go out and, and interview those folks and make sure that they're good, but there's a better way. There, there, there's better ways, right? And I'm going to show you some better ways, right? You have to choose the agent. You have to make sure the agent is going to be able to be able to deliver the same value proposition as you do or something close to the degree that you're the hyper-local market in your market, they have to be the same in the sending market, right? And I would say the same holds true with all your vendors, your attorneys, your, le your lending partners, your uh, insurance affiliate partners, your everybody, your contractors, everybody that you refer, there should be an expectation of saying, look, if I'm going to bring my ready business to you, this is what I expect. In order for you to earn the right for me to do the work and cultivate this opportunity for you to get the profit on it, my expectation is that service looks like this. And if service doesn't look like this, then I'm going to find somebody else, right? That's a reasonable request of a partner. The downside, the cons of, re of giving referrals is at that point, the customer is out of your world, is out of your ecosystem, right? At that point, it's that cut the new agent takes over as the one who cultivates that relationship over time, right? but there's still some real benefits, super benefits. Your responsibility when giving a referral, thoroughly interview the customer to understand who's a good fit for you. And again, if you've done a good job of creating a business that's built around a unique value proposition, you already kind of know that, right? But if it's still fuzzy, make sure that you interview them. What's important to you, you know, in terms of what you're looking for in, in a great experience with an agent? Thoroughly interview the agents to make sure that they can do that, that they can live up to that. And any agent who pushes back on the interview is not your partner. It's just the way it is. If you're not willing to spend some time and let me ask some questions about you and your business and how you proceed in your business, then it's cool. We don't have to be, I'll find somebody else because it's just too important to leave things up to chance. Communicate that level of service expected 
follow up with the customer, follow up the agent. You're not going to micromanage this relationship. Right, you're not going to micromanage it in every step of the way. Call up the agent and say, "Hey, did you get the uh, did you get the appraisal done yet? Hey, did you do this? Did you do that?" No, don't micromanage this relationship. But I think it's important to check in, right? I do have built into the the other business model that I run where we have regular check ins. Uh, if I send a referral out, the expectation is that I'm going to check in on a regular basis about once a month just to say, "Hey, how are things going? Is there anything I can do? Is there anything I can do to help?" Right, but set up that expectation. And I, I think I'm going to step aside here for a second because I think, yes, I did. Uh, I'm going to share my screen one more time, and you're going to see in the handouts here for this course. This is page number. What is page number? It's page number 19 in your lead generation 36123 manual, the agent agent referral manual. Here's some screening questions. Right, there's a whole list of them right here. You know, what is it that you love about the work that you do? Uh, which do you like to do better? You know, list homes, work with buyers. How long have you been in the business? What's your area of expertise? What geographic areas do you serve? There are some places that we can use command to do some research, right, on, on where they serve. And I'm going to show you how to do that. But uh, can you give me a brief history of the area that you work in? How do you stay current? All these great questions, right? And then think of some of your own. But I would encourage you to start by going to the manual, go to page number 19. It's the session again on agent to agent referrals, download these questions and start to figure out what would be the questions that you would want to ask of a partner that you're going to pan give business to. Right. Um, I think I gave some of those right here. Let me get back into the slideshow. Um, where am I play from current slide? There we go. Um, okay. The rewards, we've touched on this. When you give is effort and commission. The effort when you're sending a referral is low. The, the commission is low, the effort is low. On the other side, when you're receiving, the commission is higher and the effort is higher, right? Um, reasons to tap in. Real estate agents, there's a lot of them out there and there's a read, readily identifiable source because you get to get into the databases of other people. It just gives you so much leverage, right? And agents who kind of focus on this, they get it. They understand the, ref the benefits of referrals. And so they understand how to do this the right way. People who are purposeful about this. It does provide e additional reason for attending events. When you start to think about networking events, uh, I like to think about it in two different ways. There's the local networking events and then there's the distant networking events. The local networking events I don't usually think of those. I, I want to have relationships with those agents. I don't usually think of those as referral opportunities, though. I think about going to these events so that I can build a better relationship with a co-broke agent of the future. If I can go to a board event with you or I can go to a happy hour and, and, and see you there and we can build a friendship and a relationship, then when we do business together on the co-broke side, we have a better chance of that business going smoothly. I also think that the local networking events are good opportunities for people to, um, to get to know you and for you to build a relationship so that there is an opportunity to think about profit share and inviting people to explore Keller Williams as a place of running their business, which we're going to touch on today. But I think that the, the more distant networking events, we're going to talk about reciprocal markets in a minute, people who are more likely to be the place where you would send business that you wouldn't do yourself or receive business from that you, that, you, uh, that you don't work in already. Those do require to do a little bit of travel to some of those networking events. Those are the kinds of events that are the more national events, the KW uh, mega camps and the family reunions and sometimes the triple play events when you're at um, Atlantic City in December, right? Those kinds of events are where you can network for people that are outside of your market and start to think about those sending and receiving relationships, right? Um, Okay, let's talk about getting started. We're moving just through this mindset stuff quickly. We've touched on this. It's just like any other group in your database. You've got to stay top of mind. It's repetition. It's repetition. It's repetition. It's figuring out who is the best person for you to get into a relationship. Who is your ideal referral partner because they have access to your ideal client and be memorable, right? What do you do to be memorable? Now, I'm going to tell you the best way to be memorable is through being good and being competent and being responsive. 
I think that sometimes, especially at the big national events, people try to be memorable by being outrageous. And I mean by that is it's not uncommon when you go into the main exhibit hall uh, of a big national event like Keller Williams Family Reunion, that you see somebody who is looking to do business, their business is based in Scottsdale, Arizona, and they're trying to find people who are looking to get into a relationship with a Scottsdale agent. And so they dress up like a giant cactus. Or, or you get somebody who's New York based and they dress up like the Statue of Liberty with all green and a big torch in their hand. That's memorable, but I don't think it's being memorable for the right stuff, right? I think you want to be memorable because you get into relationship and over time you nurture that relationship and you drip on that relationship using smart plans the same way we would build them for our clients. And we provide value and the value add for the referral partners is our knowledge of our market, right? Our knowledge of our market and why we would be the best person for them to think about. So the question is, I'm gonna just throw it out here. What makes you different and unique from all the other agents competing for agent agent referrals? What is it that you know that you do differently than your peers that make you a better choice? Anybody have any thoughts around that? Maybe things that maybe they do already or things that they aspire to do? Any thoughts? You can throw it in chat or you can unmute. If you haven't thought of something yet, I encourage you to think about it, right? You could just start with a premium referral fee, right? You could be the 30% person when everyone else in your market is the 25% person. Look, the marginal difference on 5% of the total gross commission is, is nothing when you think about the cost of actually having to go out and find that business on your own. But I want you to think about what is your value proposition. We talked about that in module two, to start thinking about your value proposition for your clients. Same holds true. What's going to be unique for you as a referral partner, right? Screen and qualify. Keep these folks top of mind. Make sure your customer comes first. Prepare qualification questions to ask. I showed you where some of those were in the manual already. I would encourage you to, to look when you've got some ideas of people that, you, that might be good candidates to refer to. I would encourage you to go out and do some snooping. Do a Google search on them, just like a client would. If you type their name in the search box on Google, what's the first thing that you see? Do they have any testimonials? Do they seem to have a strong footprint in the real estate space or do they seem invisible, right? All that stuff is important. Do your research. And I'm going to show you in a minute how to do some research on command, which I think is, is really, really useful. But online testimonials are really important because people will tell you whatever they want to tell you. But I would rather hear it from somebody who they worked with in terms of what their experience really was like. These are some of the sample questions. We touched on those before in the manual. Go look at those. Know when to refer when the customer is um, out of town. Know when to refer when the customer is out of your geographic area, out of your skill set, right? We touched on some of that already. Here's the nuts and bolts. What you want to do is you want to negotiate the referral fee up front before you make the introduction. It's almost no different than when you're showing a for sale by owner property. You want to make sure that that seller is going to pay you a commission if you bring your buyer. And so what we do is we have a form that's called the permission to show form. It's in the, currently it's in the dot loops, in the loops and dot loops. And when we switch over to DocuSign, it will be in the form sets there. But the permission to show form says, before I bring my buyer, you're giving me permission to show this house. And if my buyer chooses to buy this house, you're agreeing to pay me of a commission of whatever we negotiate. And that gets signed in advance. Well, it's no different here. Because what you don't want to have happen is for this, the agent who you send business to, to conveniently forget when it comes time at the closing table to say, oh, wait, that's not how this lead came to me. I met this person some other way. If you have that referral form signed before you provide the information, and I'm going to um, try to show you a way, even when you're sending referrals through command, that you can get that commitment before you reveal the contact information, but negotiate the referral fee upfront. Typically 25% is what we see here. Factors that, that influence that rate, marking conditions, price range. Again, at this super high end, at the Uber luxury end, where total commissions tend to not be as high because the total dollars are that high, a big percentage, a 25% cut, maybe more than you're gonna see. 
on a referral at a big high luxury. Just know that that impacts this, right? The number of referrals previously received from the same agent could impact. You may find if you're sending, um, if you're sending business consistently to someone on volume, you know, they may be willing to pay you more, right? Uh, potential work time involved, all these different things. If the, and what I mean by that is if the lead is hot and ready to go, you're likely to negotiate a higher premium than when the lead is lukewarm or the lead is someone that you know nothing about. It's just a name that showed up who responded to an ad and you're going to send it to somebody else and, and try to earn 25% of all the hard work that they do. Good luck. I, I'm not sure that you've added enough value in that to earn that much, but you've earned something. So everything's negotiable, right? But both parties should complete the referral form. We do have a referral form that you should use. Again, it's in dot loop. It's also on the KW website, I believe, in each one of your market centers, you can get this form. And what it simply says is two columns, buyer and seller side, who are the agents? Who is the agent that you're sending the referral to or receiving the referral from? What's the negotiated commission? All that stuff is spelled out beforehand. And if you're sending the referral out, there is a place for the agent's broker to sign off because ultimately, the agent really can't commit the broker to pay the referral fee. It's the broker's commission that gets shared with the agent, earned by the agent. However, there's a place where we ask the broker or the manager just to sign off so that everybody's in agreement that, that you've earned this right. Because I don't want you to be in a position to say, you get to the closing table and the agents agreed to pay you the commission and the broker says, well, wait a second, this is somebody that we've had in our company database forever. We're not paying a commission to that person. They didn't bring this person. We already knew them. Get that signed by all the parties up front, right? Any questions around that before we get into some changing gears here? Okay, here's a chat, pop. And in the chat, uh, the broker signed and the agent did not. It was two potential listings, Susie, that stinks. Uh, the, bro wait, the broker signed and the agent did not. Well, ultimately, the broker is the one who's obligated to the commission. So if the broker signed the commission, there shouldn't be a problem there, right? Anyway, I'd encourage you to bring that back to your broker in your office. I suspect you probably already did. But, but again, it's the agent who can't commit the broker. Once the broker is committed to pay the commission, that's it. That's what it comes down to, right? Anyway, we'll keep moving. Some myths. I don't need to actively prospect or market real estate agents. Truth, just like any other group, you've got to properly target them and properly nurture those relationships over time. Cultivate your farm, pick a narrow market, dominate it, and agents are just another farm, right? I'm going to move along here because I'm making the case, and I think I'm trying to make a pretty strong case. I'm going to skip through some of these myths, and I want to kind of get into some real um, nitty-gritty here. One of the things that you want to think about in terms of building these relationships, and again, all these myths, you can go back. If you want to go download that PowerPoint, you can go back and do that. Because I've added in the piece about profit share, I'm going to skip through that a little quicker right now. But I think, I hope I've made a strong case for why this is an important source of business. One of the things that you want to think about is migratory patterns. What does that mean? It means where are people coming from and where are they going to? It just makes sense that if I'm gonna be receiving referrals and sending referrals, then I try to think about where are the people that I'm gonna send likely to go to and have a referral partner on that end, and where are people that I would receive coming from and have a partner on that end? And we call those migratory patterns. If you really wanna see that at a super, super high level, you know, there's people, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the guy right now, and I'm blanking out, and I shouldn't because he's a, one of the senior VPs now in our Keller Williams world. And I'm blanking out on his name. But regardless, a couple years ago, he had a television show and it was called Score This Home or Score That Home, something like that. You can YouTube it and find old episodes and you'll know who I'm talking about. It's not Josh team, but it's someone else. In any event, he had a, he had a really smart idea. In undergraduate, I believe his story was that as an undergrad, he studied sports management and got into the sports management world for a number of years and had built relationships with um, professional agents, sports agents, typically in the NFL. He, he knew a lot of NFL agents. And so one of the things that he did was that he recognized migratory patterns. There's only a limited number of teams that play in a limited number of cities. And so if a player gets traded from one team to another, there's only a limited number of markets where they can go. 
And what he recognized is that he had relationship and influence with the agents through his relationships, what he now was a real estate broker. And what he needed to do was to develop a referral partner in each NFL city so that as agents got traded, he could place the referral. And here was his model. And it was a really cool model. He didn't hand the client over and say, here's a player who's being traded from Buffalo to St. Louis. I need a great agent in St. Louis who can show him homes. What he says is, oh no, this is my client. I need an agent in St. Louis who's licensed in St. Louis, who can get me into the inventory, who can write the contract and help do the things that I'm not licensed to do in that state. I need a partner. However, this is my client. I'm showing them. You're unlocking the door and you can be with me, but I'm showing them the house. And I'm ultimately the one who's, who's earning the lion's share of this commission because it's, it's my commission. It's my client. The traditional referral fee of when you're sending a referral, giving them 75% and keeping 25 was turned around. What he did was he said, look, I'm going to give you 25%. If you do the technical things that I need done in your city and I'm keeping the 75%. And if you're not willing to do that, I'll find somebody who will. Right. But it was built around migratory patterns because there were limited places where these players could go. So what I want you to think about is I want to show you something real quick. I've put this website here and I think what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to cut and paste this website into the chat box because I want you to see it. So let me just change the chat box to everyone. And I think that website is there. And when you go to that website, let me just see if I've, if I've saved that. I think I had this queued up. I did queue it up. So let me share my screen so you can see what this article talks about because I think it's really useful for us here in New Jersey. So I'm gonna share this screen. Just tell me that you can see the screen real quick. Somebody give you a thumbs up or unmute. Tell yes. me you can see. Okay, this yes. is the internet article that I put in the chat box. And what it says is, where do New, New Jersey out migrating millennials go? And as you scroll through this article, what it's saying is destination cities and destination areas. And they break it down by millennials and older folks. And so when people are out migrating from New Jersey, the number one place that millennials go is New York, typically Manhattan. Also happens to be, interestingly enough, the place that older out migration goes is Manhattan. Interesting. You may find that that may not hold true in your hyper local market, but as you look through and start to see these target cities, right? The millennials tend to go to outside of Philadelphia, then Brooklyn, then Queens, then Northeast Philadelphia suburbs then Wilmington, Delaware, right? On the other side, older folks, Manhattan, number one, West Palm beach, Florida, Boca Raton, number two, also Philly, and around Philly, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, number four. It's just interesting to try to source, help me get a clue as to where people are coming and going. I think this is only looking at out migration. Oh, uh, yeah, it doesn't have the in migration. But that is something that I think is a useful beginning to take a look at and start to see. I'd encourage you to download that article, take a look at it and start to think if, if older folks who are leaving New Jersey are, are going commonly to places like, um, Orlando or, or Philly or Cape Corals, Florida or Fort Myers or Fort Lauderdale or whatever, might it be a smart idea for me to develop a partner in that market? Again, these, if you're out migrating, who are you looking for? A strong listing agent or a strong buyer's agent at that point? Anybody just jump in. If I'm sending a referral who's leaving New Jersey to go to Florida, do I want a strong buyer's agent or a strong seller's agent? buyers there you go that perfect right in migration right when we look at in migration i'm going to show you how to use command a little bit to do that i'm looking for strong listing agents because they're listing and sending the home and they're becoming buyers in my market so let me get back in here for one moment here because i want you to leverage command and in fact let me just go right to command Give me a second to get my command account up. I'm gonna show you how to do this. And some of you may have gone to some classes where you've seen this already. And if you have, that's cool, but I'm gonna show you again. Um, give me one more second here. Stop that share and start this share. All right, command. Too many moving targets here. 
Okay. All right, here we go. Uh, here's my command account. Okay, you can see my command account. I'm gonna go to, and if you can't let me know, but I'm gonna go here to the red KW, I'm gonna open this up. And if you open this up, what you're gonna see is all the different menus here. I'm gonna go down to referrals. Now, quick, before we get any further, how many people are familiar and have played around and are starting to build a referral network here in command? I'd like to just put in chat either yes or no. Yes, I am familiar with this module and referrals and I have started to build a referral network or no, meaning not yet. I'd just like to see where we are today. No right or wrong answer. I just wanna see where we're at. And in the chat box, I'm starting to see not yet, no, not yet. Okay, good. Then I'm gonna show you some really interesting things, I hope. For starters, when you click on the referral module, what it's gonna to default to is the page of referral relationships that you've got. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't have a lot of those. Um, my broker's license actually, interestingly enough, is in my own company and not with Keller Williams. I'm a, I'm a staff person. So, and I don't do business uh, actively right now. So I have referral partners if I have opportunities to send things, but I don't have a lot of them. Although note to self, Al Donahue is right there. I'm not stupid. If I am going to have a referral partner, my boss is one of them that I'm going to put in. Brad Korn, who is a great agent in the Kansas City market, a good friend, the co-author of the book, um, Michael Gerber's book, The, um, the E-Myth was rewritten specifically for the real estate industry. The E-Myth for real estate agents was actually co-authored by Brad. But here's what I want you to look at. The dashboard is where this defaults to. What I want you to think about is migratory patterns. I want you to go over here to where it says map. And here's how I want you to go. When you click on this, it's gonna to default to a map. And if you look at this drop down here, it's gonna give you options. Am I defaulting to agent production? Where are their market centers? Where is my network currently, currently located? I'm just gonna click on that so you can see. When I click on that, you'll see a map of the United States show up and all the different places where people who are in my network exist are gonna populate this map. If I wanted to see where the Keller Williams market centers were, I click on that and all the places in the United States where Keller Williams has market centers is gonna show up here. And you'll see sometimes as big as we are, if you look, for example, right here, not a whole lot of Keller Williams Market Centers in West Virginia. If you had an outbound lead to send to someone in West Virginia, a Keller Williams agent may not be an option for you, right? But it shows you where the market centers are. Here's what I want you to look at. When we go back into this drop down, production, market centers, my network, do you see referral patterns? That's what I want you to click on. And here's what's going to happen. It defaults to Ridgewood for me because I'm logged into my command account as a Ridgewood agent. I've got uh, access to command as a Ridgewood agent or a Fortley agent or a Rutherford agent or whatever because I'm on staff in all of those. As Keller Williams does more business using command and as you put your transactions in command, right, you put them in as opportunities, they move over to, um, uh, to listing or to, to transactions and you move them all through the closing process it's starting to track where was this buyer coming from? Where did they move to? And it starts to establish these referral patterns. Now look how cool this is. It, it defaults to Ridgewood. I'm gonna just put my town in. I live in Westfield. And you're gonna see it's already tied to Google Maps right here, powered by Google. So do I want Westfield, Mass? No, Indiana, no, I want Westfield, New Jersey. I'm gonna click on Westfield, New Jersey. And what you're gonna see is this little cool looking map here. And it's starting to show the lines of where these migratory patterns are coming and going from. Now, the thing I will tell you is because we're just really beginning to ramp up using command, not every city is represented here yet. If you had a small town and some small hamlet somewhere, there's a pretty good chance that you put that in, even though Google can find it, you might not find a referral pattern yet. My recommendation in that instance would then be to go ahead and find the closest Keller Williams market center to that geographic area and look for referral patterns that way, right? But my town actually happens to have a Keller Williams office in it. And so Westfield, New Jersey is, is, is in here. And what I want you to look at is these two buttons here. This is referrals that are being sent. Where are they going? And if you look to the right-hand side, number one is Summit. People leave Westfield to move to Summit 8% of the time. Jersey City, 
Carlsbad, California. Interesting. Never would have known that. Hoboken, New Jersey, number four, right? Uh, Point Pleasant, New Jersey. Wouldn't have expected that necessarily. San Diego, California. It's just showing you in order of sorted by percentage of referrals, right? Where are these folks going to? On this button here is received. Where are they coming from? So this reorders. They're coming from Summit. They're going, they're coming from Manhattan. They're coming from Hoboken. If I was doing business in Westfield and I knew that the third largest source of where these referrals are coming from is Hoboken, might it be smart for me to build a relationship with a strong Hoboken listing agent so as they sell their condo and move down the train line, they come to me. Jackson, New Jersey, number four. Duluth, Georgia, number five. Interestingly enough, Woodcliffe, like all these things, it's interesting. And what I'd encourage you to do is do a little research and start to think about your own target markets and try to use the command and it will only become more robust over time and more accurate over time as we do more deals and put them in command. You will begin to start to see these referral patterns shaping up. Now, what do you do then? Well, okay, let's just take a look at this and I, I haven't done this, so I'm just gonna take a shot and see what happens. Um, Let's go to somewhere interesting, Peachtree City, Georgia. Now let's go to, let's go to Charlotte, North Carolina, because I suspect that there's going to be plenty of folks in Charlotte. Charlotte is still high on the list of places where people are, again, which button am I in? These are received leads. These are people moving from Charlotte to New Jersey, to Westfield. My suspicion just intuitively is that many of those folks are in the banking industry. Charlotte's a big banking hub. New York City is a big banking hub. Westfield is a bedroom community of New York City. It, makes, it could be that a lot of those are banking related transfers. I don't know for sure. But what I would want to do is to say, okay, how do I get into partnership with a strong listing agent in Charlotte, nurture that relationship so that we're sending people to the tri-state area, they come to me. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I've done this map search to track the cities. Now I'm going back into production. Go back to my drop down. I'm looking for people that are in production in what city? That would be Charlotte, C-H-A-R, there's Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm gonna click on it and here we go. Here it starts to search. Again, everybody in the Keller Williams footprint that's doing business in Charlotte, oh my God, there's a lot. Each one of these little bubbles represents a cluster. So you may want to start to think about having representation because a big metro area like Charlotte perhaps you might want to have folks in the northeast part and the southwest part that you've got partnerships with. But I'm just going to pick this right in the middle of the bubble here just so that we can zoom in. And now what begins to happen is agents are get listed in the right-hand side. And you'll notice that they're sorted randomly. And so that isn't super useful to me because I'm looking for a very specific kind of agent. These are people who are coming from Charlotte clients to Westfield I'm really looking for listing agents, right? And so I'm going to go to my sort field here and it can tell you, what am I looking for? Well, you can sort by a couple of filters here. I can look for people that are in KW coaching. If that's relevant to you, I can look for luxury uh, agents. I can look for commercial agents, agents that specialize in land. I can look for agents that are members of Keller Williams young professionals group. I can even look for people that are on expansion teams. But what I'm really looking for is people that are strong listing agents. I want listings sold. So I'm going to use this filter here. And for me, a strong listing agent, let's just say I'm looking for somebody that's had at least, you can pick a number. Let's say I'm looking for people that had at least 10 closed listings in the Charlotte market. I'm going to apply that filter. And what's going to happen is now I've got five. I've got five people in that little bubble here who are doing listing at a high enough level that they've closed uh, at least 10 this year. I believe it's this year. These are annual numbers, I believe. And what I'm going to do here now and, and, is I can, also, I can also sort this way. I can sort by first name, last name. I can sort by last name, first name. I can sort by closed units. In fact, let's change this filter. Let's turn this off. In fact, I want to do this a different way. I'm gonna cancel that filter. And my number here is should be high, right? We're gonna go back into production. I wanna reset this so that we've got a big number here. I may just have to hit enter again. Let this repopulate. 
Takes a minute. Ding, ding, ding. Come on. Map. All right, it's gonna make me go all the way back out again and go back to Charlotte. C-H-A-R-L-O-T, stick with me guys. I'm gonna get to the good stuff here. Now we've repopulated this whole big list, right? And we're zooming in on that big center of the list. And I've got this whole big list that's listed in random order popping up there. I want to find listing agents. I'm gonna select random and I'm gonna go down and say, show me people sorted top to bottom by the number of listings that they sold. If I'm sending a New Jersey agent to another city, I'm gonna look for buyers sold, right? Cause I'm sending them a buyer lead. But I'm gonna sort this by listings sold and it's gonna reorder this list of 371. And it looks like right now, Trent's the big gun, followed by Steven, followed by David. Let's take a look. If we look at Trent, we click on his name, you're gonna, you're, it's gonna take you to his contact information. He's done 1,408 units, 524 listings sold in this target market. He could be a pretty good option. I'm gonna read his bio, five years with Keller Williams, gonna learn a little bit about him. He's the rainmaker on a big team. He's gotta be on a big team to do that kind of volume. Here's his phone number, here's his Facebook page and his Instagram, I can sort of snoop him out a little bit. Here's the areas that he claims to specialize in, right? And so I'm gonna do my research this way. And if I determine that Trent is someone that I want to invite to be in my network as a partner, I'm gonna click this little button here, this little person with a plus, and it's gonna open up, would you like to send Trent an invitation? to be part of my referral network. And you're gonna type a personalized message in here and you're gonna hit send. And Trent is gonna get an email from you that says, hey, I would love to have you in my network. And you're gonna put a personalized message in there and then you're gonna to start to reach out and nurture that relationship, right? I want you to think about these referral patterns. I want you to go into the map. I want you to start to look and see what are the cities where people are coming and going from that are relevant to your target market. And then I want you to go back and look based on production, listing agents, buyers agents of people that make sense for you to get into a relationship with. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Any questions around that? I wanna make sure you know how to do this. And I'll be willing to walk through this with anybody who wants to in an office hour. In fact, I might even do a separate standalone video on just this, cause this comes up a lot. Can you show me how to do this again? but building these relationships is super cool. And here's the other thing, when you've got a relationship or you've got a referral to send, now I wanna send Trent that referral. I click this button here and it says, I'm gonna send a referral. Is it a buyer referral? Is it a seller referral? Is it a landlord or a tenant? What's the referral fee that I want? You can slide this up and down and put down what you're looking for. When do I need you to get back to me? When do I expect to hear from you? Because if I don't hear from you, Trent, within 12 hours, I'm gonna send it off to somebody else, right? It gives you a little bit of price range here. What's the minimum price or the maximum price or any kind of notes here. Now, important to know that this message is confidential. Your client is, your client's contact information isn't going to go. You see client info here. You can either pull it from your database, somebody that's already in your command account, you can just click on that, or you can enter new contact information here, first name, last name, are they pre-approved, pre-qualified, all that stuff. But read this yellow bar, the highlighted message says that all of this information is kept confidential. The Trent doesn't see it until he's agreed to accept my referral in the time frame that I set for the referral fee that I asked for. And if you wanted to even broadcast, there's a way to broadcast that out to maybe five or to however many people you want. If I've got relationships with multiple players, I could send it out to multiple players and say, you know what, the first person who responds and agrees to take it gets it, right? I see the chat box just lit up, so let me take a look here. Impressive tech, right? Pretty cool, isn't it, Dan? As KW does more and more and more volume through command, this is only gonna be robust, more robust. So my homework assignment for you guys is play with this. <laughs> Think about the markets geographically that you're in. Think about doing these searches and trying to figure out where should I build partnerships and go out there and start to build your network, right? That's the homework assignment because if you build these partnerships now, 
Now these people are in your command account. Now we can build a targeted smart plan. And look, I don't know personally, I don't really believe that a target, that an agent needs to be on a 36 touch. I don't think they need to hear from you three times a, 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 a month. I think that's overkill. It works well for your clients to be that close to them. I think your agents, and you decide what works best for you. What I find in my experience is once a month touch is usually good. But that once a month touch really needs to be something that helps them see how I stand out in my market. It shows them things like what's going on in my market periodically. It shows them things of my unique knowledge of the market periodically. It certainly shows them the volume of closings that I've had in the market so that they see how much business I'm doing. Now, truth be told, they can log in the same way that we looked up Trent's numbers. People can look up yours here, right? So the numbers that, you're, that you have in your command account are gonna be visible to other folks. But my point is, build these relationships, start to put this in place, start to nurture these relationships. This is the opportunity that most agents don't purposefully build. They're happy to get it when it falls out of the sky and into their lap and who wouldn't, right? But success leaves clues. And, and people who get purposeful about these relationships, you saw that the number three or number four way that buyers and sellers find the agent that they work through is through agent to agent referral. Why would we not make this a pillar of our business? Why would we not get thoughtful and purposeful about cultivating these relationships based on migratory patterns? It's just one of the things that I encourage you to do, right? All right, I'm gonna stop this screen share and get back into the PowerPoint here. And we talked about command, focus over time, some of the myths that are out there that it costs too much. You know what, what we know is that from command, it doesn't cost too much to stay in touch. In fact, the lost opportunity cost is way bigger than what would it would cost you to stay in touch using command, right? Maintain the relationship over time. You know, it's just like compound interest in a bank. You know, compound interest is what I've heard described as the eighth wonder of the world. Well, I think in your database, it's just time on task over time. And that, that compound growth that happens is, is, has the same kind of impact. All right, we're gonna change to profit share for the last 20 minutes or so. But before I do, I just want a quick takeaway from, from, from this concept of agent to agent referrals and building this out. I just want any kind of quick ahas or things that you're thinking differently about. Could you see yourself um, putting the time investment into making this one of the, the, the legs of your business. And one of the things I will tell you is that all markets don't rise and fall together. Um, it does make sense to have people in different markets so that if your market is slower, you can receive, you know, uh, you can, you can get business sent out to other places. The, the thing I also want you to think about in terms of agent to agent referrals, and then we'll, then I'll ask you to answer the question about ahas. Don't just be thinking about people that my clients, where are they going? You wanna position yourself in your database as the research and referral person. If my sister who lives in Cincinnati chooses to move to Orlando, Florida, I want her to come to me so that I can go into command and research a great agent in Cincinnati for her to sell her house and a great agent in, in Florida for her to buy her house and earn that referral fee on both sides. I wanna be seen as the go-to person to make that happen. Go back to Doris Carlin's statement of, when my client is moving, where are they going? When my client is coming, where are they coming from? Can I get involved on the other side of that transaction? I want you to be known in your database as the person that they come to, to get insight for where they should go in markets that you don't have expertise and let them leverage your command. Could you see that? as being a source of business. You know, one last thought on this, and, and I'll just kind of put it aside for a second. I had a friend, a, a good friend, uh, who worked with me in the Mark Lamb Market Center years ago. And um, long story short is she had a kidney transplant as a young person and, and, and ultimately had a second kidney transplant years later. But there was a period of time when she physically wasn't capable of buying and showing homes to the high level that she would because she was having medical issues. Well, one of the things that she was really smart about, she was from Toronto before she moved here to the States, is she was really smart about building agent relationships in multiple parts of the Canada and, and the United States through Keller Williams. 
And what happened was she had a good database. She was active on social media. She positioned herself as the person to help people do the research and find the right age in their market and do it just the way that I was describing. At periods of time when she wasn't physically capable of going out and putting business together on her own because her physical health didn't allow her to do that, she could do that referral research and connecting remotely on the computer. And as a result, in a time when we are so tied to being able to physically get out and do the work, right? We are so tied to, to being able to perform the tasks ourselves, her income didn't take a significant hit. It took a bit of a hit, but it didn't fall off the table because she couldn't go to work anymore because she could do this re referral work and she kept her income in a sustainable place. That's just the kind of leverage I want you to think about how you could build into your own life. So with that, any ahas, any takeaways from the first half before we move quickly into profit share? I want to hear a couple of ahas, hopefully. Chat box is good. Unmuting is better. I got to believe that there's some. Well, I'm, I'm just impressed with the technology and this is a whole resource and, and potential revenue stream. But I'm also thinking about as a new agent without any um, history, how I would approach that. You know, one of the things I'd say to you, Daniel, is as somebody who's just building your own track record and legacy in your own market, what you don't have is your own track record yet. What you do have is the technology. Maybe the, fast, the fastest entry point would be as you're building relationships with people in target markets, again, think you know, primarily uh, reciprocal markets, right? As you're building that out, I would really try to leverage my sphere of influence right now the way that Andrea did, the way that I described, where you can use this impressive technology to be the problem solver of people in your database who may not be in your market. What we know is that the average person moves every 10 years. What that means is 10% of your database is likely to be moving this year. And what we know is that the average person, according to research, knows anywhere between six and 10 people in their database, their sphere, who are likely to move over the course of a year as well. So if I had family members in other markets or friends in other markets or other jobs and other people, and I knew that those people probably knew six to 10 people that were likely to move this year, I want to be the one that they think of when they say, hey, my brother's thinking about moving, but he should really talk to Daniel so Daniel can do this research for him and help earn the referral fee. That's where I would try to leverage first. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Any other takeaways before I move quick into profit share? Okay, then let me move quick into profit share. This is not a full-blown profit share class. I do teach a class on profit share, which is a full hour, um, and I'm not, gonna, um, I'm not gonna go that deep here. In fact, I probably am gonna skip some of these slides in the interest of time. But I want you to understand the opportunity that profit share is in Keller Williams. And, and I, I'll give you a quick history, quick history, as to why it even exists. Back in the 1980s, Real estate brokerage in the United States was practiced in a very similar model, meaning it was a very broker centric model. The broker typically was responsible for generating the business through the broker's marketing efforts and, and driving people into the office and to, and to make the phone ring and all that stuff. And the broker owned largely creating the business and the agents then served the business that the broker generated. And in that model, in that relationship, the broker earned a bigger part of the commission, 50% typically. And that was the model forever in real estate until the mid eighties. And then what happened was there was a, a company, some of you may have uh, heard of it, a little company, a small startup. Uh, they have a red, white, and blue balloon. They call themselves Remax. What happened was a group of agents came together and said, why am I paying my broker 50% of my commission? Truth be told, yeah, the broker's doing advertising and marketing and things like that. But quite honestly, my business is coming through my relationships, through my database, through my sphere of influence. And quite honestly, my broker's not really earning the right to pick my pocket for 50% of the commission. And so what would be this new model of, of, of real estate, which began in 1987, I believe, Dave Laniger and some others started this startup model that moved away from a broker-centric model to an agent-centric agent model that said, 
we're going to create a model where the agent keeps most of the commission and just buys back the services from their broker that they need. Long story short, that kicked off when that happened. A lot of Keller Williams agents who, Keller Williams' number one broker in the city of Austin at that time, left and went to Remax. In fact, 40% of the top agents quit on one Friday afternoon, came to Gary Keller and said, look, it's not personal. We love you. But the reason why we're doing this is to kind of support our own families. And if I can keep more of the commission dollars over at Remax, as much as I love what you're doing here, I got to do this for my family. I'm going to move. So about 40% of the top agents left on a Friday afternoon. And oh, and by the way, on Monday, they came back and they recruited away the entire administrative team as well. And so it really was like this atomic bomb that blew up in the Keller Williams world. And uh, Gary was smart enough to recognize that in the face of every crisis becomes an opportunity. And what he did was he stepped back and he said, look, how could we build a model? Because I do believe that the broker does add some value to the, to the agent relationship. There's the broker centric model. Now there's this agent centric model. And how could we build a, 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 a partnership model where both the broker and the agent win together? And that became the third model, which Keller Williams sort of pioneered. And in that model, became profit share as a way that agents could continue to win as the broker won. And it was really built around, they looked at a lot of different things in terms of a profit sharing model. Uh, ultimately, what they settled on was they, they, they R&D, they researched, they ripped off and duplicated, <laughs> they researched and then ripped off a profit share model that was being utilized by a luxury builder in the Houston, Texas market of how they rewarded their folks inside their own company by helping the company grow. We have a unique business model where our commissions are capped. And in that world, just do the math. We need a bigger sales force because if after a certain level of transaction volume, the broker no longer earns any income, I just gotta have more people. And in that model, what the determination was is the, the way to incentivize the pathway through profit share is if you can use your influence to attract talent. And that talent helps us to grow and become more profitable. Then when that business closes, then the broker is willing to share a percentage of their profit, not their commission. This is not a revenue sharing model. There are some companies out there like Exit and some others that have a revenue sharing model that says, look, the commission comes in, there's $10,000 because it's revenue that came in due to an agent who you attracted to us. We're going to give you a chunk of that revenue, whether we're profitable or not. That's not the Keller Williams model. Keller Williams is built on a win-win philosophy. The only profit there is to share is profit that the broker has after all expenses, right? So here's how this works. An associate joins any market center anywhere in the world and names you as their sponsor. And every agent who's on the Zoom call, if you're a Keller Williams agent, you identified someone who was your sponsor. My hope would be that that conversation was thoughtful and in integrity to try to determine who really was the most influential in your making your decision to come here. Sponsorship should not be who is the first person to tell you about Keller Williams. Sponsorship should be who is the person who kind of really helped that light bulb come on. I think in very rare cases, well, let me rephrase that. Having been a team leader and knowing that the team leader's role is to recruit and to grow the market centers and that the team leaders spend so much time going out there and cultivating and nurturing and getting into relationship with agents and nurturing them over time. And when that agent comes, frequently the team leader gets named as a sponsor, which is you know, part of the reward of, of that level of recruiting. However, I think sometimes what also happens is as an agent, we cultivate interest and curiosity about this company and give that name to our team leader. And um, then that team leader does their thing. The team leader's job is to recruit and to convert. Your job is to create curiosity. It's really well-established protocol inside the Keller Williams universe that if an agent introduces an opportunity to a team leader, if that person comes and joins the market center, that the team leader should do everything in their power to make sure that the agent is the one named as the sponsor and not the team leader. Because it's really easy sometimes, and I've been a team leader where I've been given a lead, if you will, by one of my agents, and I worked that lead for two years. 
And when the person finally came, they said, look, you know, the reason why I'm coming is because I want to work with you because I see how successful your market center is. And I know the level of coaching that you're giving to your agents. And I want some of that. And I'm coming here because you're the attractor. And I'm saying, wait a second, you wouldn't have shown up in my world were it not for this agent who introduced you to me. If you really want to think about this, I really think that you should probably name that person as the sponsor. To me, that's what integrity looks like. But the way it works is that agent joins the market center, they name a sponsor, and now here's what happens. This is profit share. So the person actually has to do some business. <laughs> you don't get to have a share of the office's profit if the agent that you attracted into the company didn't contribute to it, right? So the associate has to come in and they have to close some business and then they have to be paying company dollars through the split, right? And that's what happens. They come in, they close, the 70% goes to the agent, 30% comes to the company. And then here's what has to happen next. The market center has to have a profitable month. We do something really unusual and unheard of in the business world. Most businesses run their books on an annual cycle. They open the books in the beginning of the year, they close the books at the end of the year, they determine whether there's profit. We do it every month. Every month, here's what happens. We close the books. Your MCA and your market center closes all the books. They, here, they, they pay off all the bills. Any outstanding debt that's paid is paid before they reopen the books yet again for the next month. And in that process, and I'll walk you through it real quick in another couple of slides, but once they have collected all the commissions, paid all the agents, paid all the bills, whatever is left is company profit. It's the company profit that gets shared. It's the owner's profit that gets shared. There's a misconception out there sometimes in the universe that what we're doing is taking some of the commission dollar away from the agent that we recruited or that we attracted and taking the money out of the pocket of that agent. That is not at all what happens. Agent gets all of their commission. It's the company dollar that gets divided up. So here's the thought. If you are tracking an agent who's not in production, you're not likely to see a profit share check that month, right? What happens is at the end of the month, when we close the books, whatever profit is left is distributed. And I'll show you very quickly how that divides up roughly, but it's the profit share pool that gets distributed to the agents. If I had an agent who didn't contribute profit to the month then in the next month when the distribution goes out and it's always the 21st day of the following month that that profit share distribution shows up. We used to call it the day of mailbox money. Well, we're not mailing paper checks anymore. It's all done through electronic transfer. When you came on board, you were asked to identify a bank account so that when all this is done, that profit share check could get automatically put into your bank account. But if the agent that I attracted in didn't close business in that month, then there's no profit distribution coming to me in the following month. Same holds true with capping agents. If I attract a megastar and after two or three months in, the, in their calendar year, they cap, then what happens is at, they're doing business and as they close business, they're keeping all of the money. And so they're not paying anything towards the profitability of the office in that month. And so profit share while the agent who is in your downline is capped and no longer contributing is, is sort of suspended for a while because they're not contributing towards the profit of the office that month. When they uncap at the end of their cycle again, that profit share turns back on again. And just to give you some perspective, the value, the dollar value of a capping agent in our world with a cap of about 37 in our market centers, it's a moving target and, I, and there's a whole complicated uh, math formula, which I teach in the longer class about this in terms of how we actually calculate what profit share is. But the value of a capper is, is around four, $4,500 to $5,000 a year in profit share. Half capper would be half of that, you know, $2,500. Somebody who's closing somewhere around two and a half million dollars a year in volume, you would expect typically to see something on the order of about two to three thousand dollars a year in profit share if you identify that person and so and so the point is there's an opportunity there i will tell you myself i am not the biggest profit share earner in this company in bergen county partners i can think of lots and lots of folks and you can go into your keller williams website 
and it's in the public report section that if you go to your KW website right next to your picture, there's a little button that says reports. There are profit share reports in there and you can take a look and see how much profit share is being earned by folks. Um, there are people inside our Bergen County Partners Organization that are earning in excess of, you know, $50,000 a year in profit share, number, quite a number of them. I'm probably not at that volume. I know I'm not at that volume, but I can tell you this. Today is the 24th, three days ago, we had our profit share distribution. I went back and looked and it was the 73rd straight month in a row that I got something, right? And sometimes it's a kind of a couple hundred bucks. Sometimes it's a couple of thousand bucks. Um, a couple months ago, it was like 10 bucks because in the, in the pandemic, there was very little profit in those months. But my point is it's consistent. It's consistent because, uh, because the agents that are in my downline are consistently producing. So here's what I want you to think about. I'm gonna skip over that sign. Here's how this works. This is you, you've been out in the sun, you're a little bit red right now. And here's what happens. You have a sponsor, right? You named a sponsor. And the sponsor came in and they named the sponsor as well. And, and the profit share system goes back seven different levels. It's a little bit like the book of Genesis in the Bible where you start with, it's the slowest read of all time, who begat who, and just goes for chapters and chapters and chapters, right? Well, here's what happens. This is you, this is your sponsor, this is your sponsor's sponsor, your sponsor's sponsor had a sponsor. This whole chain goes back seven levels and then it bookends. Only seven different levels of people are going to be in your profit share line. Hold that thought in your head for just a second. How far back can you go? You can go back online into your profit share report and you can trace your tree. You can see who your sponsor is. You can see who your sponsor sponsor is, etc. You can go back and look. And I've done that a, a number of times. And I think it's useful to go back and look because one of the things that happens is when you close business, all of those seven levels of people are going to earn a percentage of the profit share distribution because of the influence in the profit share tree, right? And if they have a financial invested interest in you closing business, don't hesitate to tap them from time to time for some help and some knowledge. Um, I know that Sue Adler is uh, number four, level three or four in my profit share tree. I don't have any problems if I was an agent calling up Sue and saying, hey, Sue, I've got this really challenging problem right now. And um, if I can land this deal, you're going to get a little bit more profit share. So can you help me? <laughs> right now, look, I just think that's a great thing to go back and trace your trade, right? Anyway, we're going to move along. When someone names you as a sponsor, when you use your influence to create curiosity, I don't want you to go out and recruit. Your job isn't to recruit. Your job is to sell inventory. Your job is to sell houses. Your job is to build a really, really big, powerful, wonderful life and have people start to say, oh my God, what is he doing? Like, how is he doing this? And create curiosity. There's the scene, and it's, it's, I apologize if this is a little inappropriate for some of you, but there's a scene in the movie where Harry met Sally, where Meg Ryan is sitting in the restaurant and um, some of you may know the scene that I'm talking about where she's at the dessert and Billy Crystal is with her and she starts to put on a little bit of the show in the restaurant and it starts to get a lot of attention. And there's this one woman who looks over at Meg Ryan and says, I'll have what she's having, right? Some of you may know the scene that I'm talking about and if you don't, don't worry about it. But my point is, what I really want you to do is to build such a big career and such a big life that people say, I want some of what they're doing and create curiosity. And once they're in curiosity mode, then your job is to tee them over. Uh, Christina got my joke, is to tee them up for your team leader. Then your team leader takes it from there. Your team leader runs, meets those appointments. And in your market centers, your team leaders have empowered and trained several of the staff to do some of these appointments as well. But, but it's not your job to do the recruiting. Let someone whose job, who's been trained to do that, convert them. Your job is to create curiosity, but when you get named as your sponsor, they go in your first level. The first level is the only thing that you can control. You can control how many people you influence to join or to think about coming to Keller Williams and naming you in this, in this company. Some of the people that you pick will do business, some won't. Some of the people that you get named by will grow their level and some won't. What we find is that if you really want to get purposeful about building your downline, the same way you get purposeful about building your referral network, 
is you have to put some time and thought into it and energy and into it. It's time on task over time, like anything else. The tipping point becomes about 15. When you've been named as a sponsor by 15 individual people, what begins to happen is that some of those people will do a lot of business, some won't, some of those will grow their levels, some won't. But at about 15, it kind of tips. That's about the time where the, where the profit share tree begins to grow on its own. You don't need to have a thousand people in your first level to do really well in profit share. You can do it with a small group if the group that you have is A, in production, and people in production are more apt to influence other people in production. Birds of a feather travel together, right? So you want to be thoughtful about building your first line. And when you build your first line, if that person gets named as a sponsor, then that person becomes your second line, right? And how many levels does this go back? It goes back seven. So here's how this works. This is me. My first level is my brother. My brother names me as a sponsor. And my brother invites his college roommate to join Keller Williams, names my brother as a sponsor. They become my second level. How many levels does this go out? It goes out seven levels. You see how big this balloons all the way out to seven levels. Can you see the geometric progression here, right? This geometric growth can be really, really powerful, right? I'm skipping through a lot of slides because I'm down to the last five minutes. Here's what I want to show you. This is the class. I've, I just put the whole class in here. We're going to do this whole class another time. Your job is just to get into relationship. Your job is just to refer let someone else do the recruiting. Your job is to inspire. One of the ways I'd love for you to inspire people is to invite them to some of these Zoom calls periodically. I know for a fact that we have guests from other companies that just jump in on these training classes because agents sometimes will call me and say, hey, I've been talking to my friend at XYZ Company, and quite honestly, they're not getting nearly the kinds of training and information that we're getting here, and they're not really happy, and I'm, I'm encouraging them to kind of think, about Keller Williams, and I'm encouraging them to meet with my team leader, but would it be okay if they just kind of got a chance to sit in on the class for themselves to see what it's like? And I would say, do that all day, every day. I can promise you in this Lead Generation 3612.3 class that in several of the modules, there were guests from other companies that were observing. And you never once heard me go into recruiting mode, did you? I'm never gonna do it. I'm never gonna go into recruiting mode in a class and cause someone to feel uncomfortable. But what I will do is I will just try to provide as much value as we can in this class so that people can say, you know what, this is something that I'm not getting where I am. Maybe I will have that conversation with the team leader after all, right? That's what I'd really love for you to do. Where could you find people to start building relationships? Don't just be thinking agents that are already existing. One of the things you're gonna find is that people who are great for our industry are already out there in other industries. Sometimes you're going to find that somebody who has all the right stuff to be a rock star in real estate sales is working in a hospitality environment or is working in another service environment. Maybe they're selling in another arena or maybe they're providing um, service of another kind. Always be on a talent search. You know, when you're out and thank God we can begin to go out again and please be smart and please maintain social distance, and please wear a mask. I really don't want to have to go back into lockdown again anytime soon. But when you get to go out and you're in a restaurant and you're getting served by somebody who is just an absolute rock star, why not have a conversation to say, hey, have you ever thought about bringing your talent into real estate? Because I think with, with the, the way that you treat people and the way that you, you serve people, I think the potential financial upside for you in a real estate environment is so much higher than it's going to be here in the, in the, in the restaurant industry. Always, always, always be on a talent search. And if you can find somebody who you can, you can inspire, that's one of the ways that I've seen people really build their downline is not necessarily finding great talent that exists. And we know that great talent that's out there is already being pitched by other folks. That's not to say that you don't try to build rapport. You do, but don't, don't oversee the fact that, Talents everywhere. Always be on a talent search, right? Okay, it's 1230. I'm going to kind of wrap it here. I'm not going into the full profit share course, but as you're starting to think about agent to agent referrals, I want you to be keeping top of mind the financial opportunity that comes with passive income. If you can get into relationship with talent and create some inspiration to think about joining this company as well. 
um, the amount of, of revenue that this company gives out in profit share every year is staggering in our Bergen County Partners Group alone. And keep in mind that real estate brokerage as a rule is a financially challenged business, as hard as it might be for agents to understand that. Brokers have so much overhead, especially in a capped commission world. Brokers have so much overhead in terms of the amount of the commission that they, that they, that they need to give away, the amount of overhead that it takes to maintain office space and to maintain staff and all that stuff, that, that the vast majority of real estate brokerages in the United States are not profitable. If you look inside the NRTA Corporation, which is the biggest network corporation of franchised organizations, companies that you may know, Coldwell Banker and Century 21 and Better Homes and Garden and ERA and all of those brands, Sotheby's, all of those brands are owned by one giant conglomerate based in Madison, New Jersey, of all places. I mean, that company right now, their stock value has plummeted. And that company right now is in, is, is, is in debt to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. There is not a Keller Williams or company anywhere in the world that's in debt because we close our books and we pay off our debt every month. My point is this, if you are astute and you think about it and you think about building your profit share opportunity the same way that we build every other relationship opportunity. What I love is that profit share becomes a source of passive income. And for guys, financial freedom, the way I define it, is if you can have your monthly expenses, your average monthly run rate, whatever it costs for you to live, your mortgage, your car payment, your food, all that stuff. If you can get all of that covered through multiple horizontal passive income streams, then you have achieved financial freedom. Because then, you know you're good, whether you choose to go to work or you don't choose to go to work. That, to me, is what financial freedom looks like. And that's what I'm working towards for my family. We're not there yet, but we're getting closer. And profit share is part of that. I would love for profit share to be part of that for you. I went on to say how much in our group. Last year, even though most real estate brokerages in the United States are not profitable, Bergen County Partners, that group of five, was profitable enough that we gave out of owner's profit to our agents through profit share $2 million. That's a lot of money. And um, there's no reason why you shouldn't have your unfair share of that. There's no reason at all why you can't have your share of that pie. And so if there's anything I can do to help you by uh, at least using the leverage of some of these classes to help someone make that decision, if I can help talk to somebody who is not gonna be seen as a team leader, to talk a little bit about this company to help you move someone along, I'll be happy to do that. But profit share is an opportunity I'd love for you to learn more about and for you to, uh, to leverage. Passive income is, the, is really the route to financial freedom and that's what I want for all of you guys. So I'm over time, I apologize, I tried to jam 10 gallons of stuff into a five gallon hat. That's what they talk, the way they talk about it in Texas, right? He's got a five gallon hat and a 10 gallon head. Um, any takeaways? Just final ahas today. Financial freedom, right, Martha? That's what we're aiming for. That's in the chat box. That's the perspective. Go read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? One of the great books at all time that talks a little bit about that. Passive income is the way to go. It's really important to think about. And there's so many, in real estate guys of all things, there's so many opportunities to think about generating passive income. Whether you think about that as becoming an investor, whether you think about that as profit share, there's so many ways in the real estate world to build pathways to passive income. You also have a very unique opportunity to become a part owner of our insurance company through referrals, to become part owner of our title company through referred business, right? Passive income is big. And, and this organization, more than any other that I've been involved in in my career, gives you pathways to that. So um, anyway, I hope there was some good stuff here for you. Just as a reminder, where we're going on Friday, it's not the end on Friday. We're going to do lead conversion and pipeline management, a sales technique skill that I don't think we teach well enough in the real estate space. It is well understood and well taught in other sales industries, not so much in real estate. But we're going to talk about how do you move people through your sales pipeline and then on Friday, we're going to wrap it up with a session on living your goals, okay? Hope this was a good use of your day today, guys. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for spending your time. And I will look forward to seeing you guys again real soon. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome.